This is an overview of the main parts of the retirement system in the United States of America. Most of the topics here will not be tested in the class because um, the tests are quantitative in nature and you will be tested quite a lot uh, later on on pension funding and valuation. But I will um, later on show you some exercises on calculation of uh, pension benefits uh, for defined benefit pension plans and the relationship of those two defined contribution pension plans because that's, that's material that actually is um, um, already uh, covered in exam LTAM. And I'm not assuming that you all passed exam LTAM, I'm simply assuming that you should learn this one way or another, preferably in some previous class, but if not, then we'll just have a short overview. I'll get to that. But let's look at those main parts of the retirement system. So the United States has a social insurance system for retirement. And social insurance, please remember, that means um, that that is a system that is administered by the government, generally universal, covering everybody. Well, everybody can have different definitions, but generally people employed in the country um, and um, it is paid for with taxes collected from those people who are covered uh, and their employers um, in a way prescribed by law. So there isn't a premium calculated in some specific way for each person, but rather a certain percentage of wages is paid by employers and employees. And that percentage is set by law, although uh, government experts in the U.S., it's Social Security Administration and uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, that establish those for the social insurance systems of Social Security and Medicare. And um, then these, uh, the advice of those people, of those experts, is used to um, set the law that says what the amount of taxes collected will be. And then the uh, other feature of uh, social insurance is that um, the benefits are prescribed by law. They're not necessarily completely determined by what is paid by a person. Now, it's true that generally there is a formula that says how the benefits depend on the contributions made by uh, a person or on behalf of that person, but the benefits are set by law, which means that when Congress meets, they can change benefits. They can change the taxes, they can change the benefits. And um, well, people who say this is a contract and it should be what it was promised get it all wrong because there is no inherent promise um, although the, the U.S. government generally um, tries very hard to keep its promises in uh, social insurance systems uh, because they tend to be pop politically popular and people get upset if their benefits are cut in any way. So anyway, the main system is called Old Age Survivors and Disability Income. Everybody calls it Social Security. It is a system administered by the federal government, by the Social Security Administration. There is also a Supplemental Security Income Social Assistance Program administered by the federal government, popularly called SSI. Uh, it is much smaller, it's not social insurance, and it's for elderly people, so you could say that it's part of the retirement system. Then we have a wide variety of employer-based pensions um, and really we call it a pension when it's a defined benefit pension plan, uh, but there are defined contribution retirement systems or pension plans as well. A defined benefit pension plan is a plan where a certain benefit is promised based on the history of wages and contributions. So the, what is promised to the employee is a certain amount of pension benefit. How much? Well, it's typically a certain percentage of wages 
um, times the number of years served. And you may say, which wages? And then the answer is, well, it depends on the plan design. Um, so it is not common anymore, but it used to be a certain percentage of the last year's salary just before retirement. It's not popular because people abused it by increasing their salary in that last year. You can take a salary average over the last five years of work, or last three years of work, or you can design a formula for some kind of uh, index of uh, wages and adjust salaries to the index and then take the average over all years of work uh, that the person has. That's actually what Social Security system does. But that's quite complex and it's rarely done. A defined contribution pension plan is a plan where um, um, an employer pays a certain promised defined amount to each employee's account every month when the paycheck is um, issued. In the U.S., employees cannot be required to make any contributions to defined benefit pension plans. In Canada, it is actually quite common that employees pay into defined benefit pension plans. However, in the U.S., uh, pension plans that are not subject to federal government regulation, such as state pension plans or um, cities, smaller municipalities, can require um, contributions from employees. However, for private pension plans, um, for a plan to receive a tax exemption um, for investments held in the plan, uh, not to be taxed, um, the uh, contributions made to the defined benefit pension plans can be made only by the employer, based on the calculation done by an actuary. And all of this work is then filed with the federal government, with the Department of Labor, and uh, it has to follow the law, and I will tell you about the laws that apply to that. Um, and, of course, defined contribution pension plans are also regulated by the Department of Labor. But those are simpler, and uh, regulation is also much simpler, because all that the employer does is just pay some percentage of wages of employees into each employee uh, individual account that this employee has um, and eventually can use for retirement purposes. Um, at a certain minimum age that is defined in the pension plan. Um, generally speaking, anything less than 55 years or a certain number of years worked, such as 30 years, um, is very rare. You have to spend a long time in employment to, um, for, to be able to draw pension. These uh, pensions are provided by various types of governments. So actually, federal government has pension plans for its employees. State and local governments, such as Chicago, City of Chicago, City of Bloomington, City of Normal, or uh, State of Illinois. Nonprofit organizations, such as schools, universities, and churches. Private employers, of course, and self-employed individuals also can set up their own um, pension plans. Individual people can also set up retirement accounts in the U.S. Um, the most popular ones are called individual retirement accounts, but there is also a version of those that are called Roth individual retirement accounts. The difference between individual retirement account and Roth individual retirement account is that the money contributed into an individual retirement account under certain conditions may be deemed tax deductible, so um, actually may be deemed not taxable, um, so that uh, the person doesn't pay taxes on the contributions to those individual retirement accounts. That's the way all pensions provided by employers work, that money contributed to the plan is not considered income to the employees, and it goes tax-free until retirement, and then upon retirement, um, the payouts to the individual person are considered to be um, taxable income. 
But um, in the 1990s, this new type of uh, an account called Roth Individual Retirement Account was created, named after a senator who proposed it. And these accounts work this way, that money going into the account is uh, taxed. However, uh, the government promised, really seriously, cross my heart, that they will never take out the distributions out of those uh, individual retirement accounts, uh, Roth individual retirement accounts, as long as they are taken at an appropriate retirement age, which is for those accounts, typically you have to be 62 and a half years old to be able to take any money out without um, really bad penalties um, prescribed by tax law. There are also deferred annuities with insurance companies where you put money into an account with uh, an insurance company, the money grows tax-free, but the contribution is not um, tax-free, it's tax, but while you have the money with the insurance company, um, it grows tax-free, and then when you uh, start taking money out, there is actually quite a complex calculation of what portion of it is not taxable because it was already taxed, the money that was contributed to the account was already taxed, and what portion should be taxed because that's that tax-free growth that you had between the time you put money in to the account with the insurance company and you took the money out. And there are restrictions about when you can do this. You have to be of sufficiently advanced age. And, of course, people can just save money if they want to. And people in the U.S., for example, borrow money against uh, the value of their home. Um, the value of the home minus any loans outstanding against that value is called home equity. So if you still have a mortgage on the home, uh, original mortgage that you used to buy a home, but... Um, you paid off a large portion of it, you can open an account with um, a bank uh, where you are allowed to borrow additional money against the house. So that's a source of money possibly in the retirement, to borrow money against your home. And the value of the home that can be borrowed is called, called home equity. The fraction of the home that you own, effectively. You can... Um, own stocks outside of any retirement accounts, or you can own businesses in some other form, because stock ownership is really business ownership. Uh, you can just have um, a regular savings account, or buy some very safe federal government bonds, uh, and maybe people will help you out when you are early. But of course, that's not exactly the only thing you can... And let's put it this way, generally it's hard to expect that this is would take care of all of your needs. Although traditional um, people from more traditional cultures um, do support their parents. Americans, I don't know. I would have to study it more carefully. But it's not um, as common, I think, to, in the U.S. for elderly to live with their children, while in many countries it is. There's also support for medical care for the elderly in the U.S., and the main system of social insurance is called Medicare, and its Part A is for hospital care, Part B for physician care, Part C is for private health maintenance organizations, which are forms of health insurance supplementing Medicare, where people can pay extra to, to have this coverage in addition to the one provided by Medicare. And then Part D, prescription drugs coverage, was re relatively new. It was started around 2005. Medicare itself was created in 1965. The first time there was talk about reforming Social Security big time and problems with Social Security and so on it was probably around 1979 when a portion of Social Security which provides disability benefits more or less completely ran out of money. There was a special commission formed the so-called Greenspan Commission, the same Alan Greenspan that later became the um, uh, chairman of Federal Reserve. Um, and there was a big debate in the 1990s about this, and there were uh, reforms proposed for Social Security, and they were to create private accounts, redirect a portion of the payroll tax to private accounts while reducing benefits accordingly. So 
what you have now is people pay taxes based on their wages, employers pay um, generally the same amount, so both employee and employer pay into Social Security, and then they get, uh, the employee gets the benefits when they uh, retire, which minimum age is 62 and a half, um, based on their history of wages, so not exactly based on what they paid in, based on the formula. Uh, so it's not really any kind of uh, investment where you know how it grows. It's what goes in is based on the formula provided by the government. What comes out is based on the formula provided by the government. So it was proposed by some group of people to redirect a portion of the payroll tax to private accounts while reducing benefits accordingly so that the government won't be responsible for as much. Uh, that's roughly the kind of reform that was done uh, by uh, the Margaret Thatcher administration in the United Kingdom, where a very large part of their uh, social insurance system was redirected to private accounts with insurance companies, um, paying the benefits in form of annuities eventually. Um, they have investment accounts before they retire, and then they buy life annuities. They are required to buy life annuities. By the way, Canadians, if they have any kind of private savings that is tax privileged, tax privileged also are required to buy life annuities when they retire with that money. Uh, the other possibility was uh, government investment. So, um, right now the government receives the money, the, the tax money going into Social Security and to uh, what is called the trust fund, uh, Social Security trust fund. Um, that money is actually borrowed by the federal government, so it's kind, of, in a sense, invested in government bonds, and it's used for current operations. And how much? Well, it's I think close to three trillion dollars. It's a lot of money, and eventually it will disappear as baby boomers retire, and they will be asking government for money. But you can see that the government was the money was already spent. The government doesn't have a budget surplus to, to pay this. The government will have probably humongous budget deficit um, as a result of this current crisis. Um, I mean, easily probably two trillion dollars in budget deficit in the next budget. We'll see how we handle this. Um, so the government will have to come up with the money. Right now, they'll just print it, and it's not printing anymore. It's just creation by the Federal Reserve. Um, so what was proposed to uh, was to not have the government borrow that money, but instead invest it in stocks. That would have worked out great in March 2020. I was, I'm being sarcastic. I probably shouldn't be. It would have been a disaster in March of 2020. It has, March hasn't finished, but it's been horrendous for the stock market and maybe even worse. Uh, we may be living through the most horrible st stock market performance in history. We'll see. Um, anyway, I wrote a paper uh, in 1996 uh, where I was very strongly against it and the proposal was not uh, put in place in any form uh, and uh, some people really disliked me for that. Um, and the third proposal was to reduce or tax uh, the benefits and increase payroll taxes, so more taxes, less benefits. For example, limit inflation indexing of benefits, increase taxation of benefits, remove upper limit on wages subject to payroll tax, because right now there is an upper limit on wages that are subject to Social Security tax. I think it's about $120,000 a year. And there is a limit on how much in, you can get in benefits. So if you, if you remove that upper limit on wages, would you remove also the upper limit on the benefits? That's a very vital question. None of these things really happened. There was, in fact, a short period of time when the payroll tax was re reduced under Obama administration to try to stimulate the economy and in the current crisis, President Trump also suggested the same type of reduction or even removal of the payroll tax to stimulate the economy. Of course, the government will still have to pay the benefits, and where would they find the money? Well, they can sell the bonds in the trust fund, but that still means that 
they would have to, the federal government would have to come up with the money because the the bonds in the trust fund are different than any regular bonds. They're puttable, so the trust fund can always sell them immediately to the federal government, and the federal government has to come up with the money at par. So there is no loss due to any market conditions. Um, and they receive rather generous interest rate, which is based on the average of long-term interest rates. So in a sense, it's an indirect subsidy of Social Security by the federal government. Um, but the federal government gets um, a lot of money still from borrowing from their trust fund, and they've been using it for other things. And, you know, they need the money. The government does need your money. They already spent it. So you need to understand that. Anyway, none of these proposals was really put in place. Uh, the Social Security system is basically the same as it was after the roughly 1983 uh, Greenspan Commission re uh, report. And for a while, until roughly 1989, um, the system was uh, in great shape, had a big surplus in the trust fund, and it was long-term actuarially sound. But around 1993, it was already in long-term actuarial deficit, and that long-term actuarial deficit has been with us until now, and it may even increase. Here's a, a general outline of Social Security key features. So it's financed by payroll tax. Um, it's 10.60% for retirement benefits and 1.80% for disability benefits split equally between employer and employee, paid in full by self-employed, on wages between 0 and 110,000 in 2012. I'm sorry, I don't have the maximum um, uh, as of 2020. Um, there's also a payroll tax of 2.90% funding of Medicare Part A, and there is no limit on income subject to that tax. That used to be uh, a limit, but it was removed uh, under uh, Barack Obama administration. Um, and uh, it was part of the um, reforms uh, of the healthcare system. Um, and this, this is a sound argument to, to increase that tax because while there are um, limits on the benefits that people pay, uh, can receive from Social Security, there are no such limits in Medicare. Medicare will pay no matter how big your spending is. And of course, this is a tax on wealthy people because they have high income, but wealthy people are eligible for Medicare as well. Uh, benefits are derived by a formula based on the history of wages, primary insurance amount, uh, PIA is equal to the uh, sum of 90% of average index monthly earnings, a, uh, AIME, average of workers' wages over best 35 years of wages adjusted from their past level by the National Wage Index that Social Security Administration prepares. Up to the first uh, bent point, uh, it's the name of the point where they change the the calculation basically, plus 32% of AIME above the first bent point uh, up to the second bent point, uh, plus 20, uh, plus 15 percent of AIME in excess of the second bent point. Automatic benefit increases based on inflation are also applied, although they have been very, very small recently, and there have been years when there were no increases. And bent points are adjusted annually, they are adjusted to wages, and one of the proposals was to adjust them to inflation because generally wages grow faster than inflation that would effectively cut some future benefits. Uh, not indexing them at all is one of the pieces in proposed reforms. There is also a separate formula for maximum family benefit. There is a spousal benefit, half of the primary benefit. So if you have worked and your spouse stayed at home, um, if you retire, your spouse you will get your benefit and your spouse will get half of your benefit. Your benefit is called the primary benefit. There's also a small death benefit and survivor benefit, meaning um, to any surviving children, um, but they have to be minor children. A system administered by the federal government, uh, by Social Security Administration, uh, which has a board of trustees that makes a decision consisting of 
and Secretaries of Labor, Treasury, Health and Human Services, Social Security Commissioner, and two uh, more. Um, and actually, I don't know if they're currently vacant, so they were uh, vacant when I first prepared these notes, but I'm not sure um, what they are right now. Some uh, issues that have happened in the U.S. pension system that kind of shocked the system. 2000-2002, uh, there was uh, were huge declines in the stock market for three years. Uh, really mm, resulted in very bad underfunding of uh, pension plans. And there was a government um, response to that in the law that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, there was also uh, the 2008 crisis. Um, and uh, after that crisis, there was also a resulting underfunding of pension plans. The current 2020 cri coronavirus crisis, that may be far worse than any of those based on the way things look right now. The retirement of baby boomers is a very big um, issue. Um, what's very interesting is that um, I actually organized a conference where the keynote speaker was the chief actuary of uh, Social Security, Steve Goss, and he made a presen presentation that uh, showed that um, there was no such thing as baby boom. It was just a normal situation that was followed by baby bust in late 1960s and after that. In other words, uh, baby boom was the normal U.S. Uh, demographic development because the number of children that baby boomers had was very consistent with the number of children that all previous generations of Americans had except for those who went to war in World War I and World War II. So there were fewer babies born uh, during World War II well, because I don't remember exactly how many, but somewhere around 15 million men were overseas doing other things. Um, and uh, so it was kind of difficult to make babies. Um, baby boomers are generation born following World War II and uh, well not just but have recently started retiring um, because 1945 plus 62 is 2007. And when did it end? Um, roughly with the hippie revolution 1968, people stopped having children or reduced the number of children greatly. And um, 1968 plus 60, that's 2028. Um, so we're looking at 2048 when they'll be 80. And uh, rough estimates are that uh, by 2050, sorry to say, but most of the baby boomers will be gone. Um, and that generation um, will cause great pressures on the entire U.S. economic system. Um, and that generation is active politically and generally unwilling to make sacrifices. Um, and, well, there is... A, an expression OK Boomer among current young people because they are a bit annoyed with them. Nevertheless, uh, they will be the ones receiving retirement benefits and medical benefits until roughly 2050 and it may be a rough uh, period. Um, on the other hand, the thing about baby boomers that's very interesting is that uh, those hippies uh, nevertheless find purpose in their work um, so they are far more likely to continue working through late years in their lives than previous generations. Uh, but advanced age will make it more difficult to perform physical labor and continued employment may result in greater need for medical care and prescription drugs. But we will see how this develops. It is true that uh, labor participation rates, a percentage of people working in the generation of baby boomers at the age that they are now is significantly higher than previous generations of the same age. So a couple of words about responses to crisis. Um, there was the law passed in 2006 called Pension Protection Act. It um, was a response to a crisis of 2002. By the time the legislation was passed, the crisis was over 2003 
um, was actually a, a fantastic year in the stock market. Uh, by 2005, the economy was roaring and possibly over roaring, and the interest rates were too low. But that's uh, being smart after the fact, so I don't know. Uh, also, introduction of Medicare Part D in 2005 meant uh, to help retirees deal with high cost of prescription drugs. This is a subsidized system of um, prescription drugs insurance for the elderly. They buy it from private insurance companies, but the cost is subsidized. The percentage of civilian non-institutionalized, so not in jail, Americans age 55 or older who were in the labor force declined from 34.6% in 1975 to 29.4% in 1993. However, since 1993, the labor force participation rate has steadily increased, reaching 38% in 2006 and 40% in 2009. Um, and increasingly, elderly workers can choose to work and work and work. Um, uh, labor participation rate for those age 55 and over with a graduated professional degree is nearly two-thirds and climbing. And that's actually a solution to the problem. Um, yes, they, the baby boomers will need the money to retire, but they're working instead of retiring. Uh, I call this the Copernicus model of retirement. Copernicus uh, never retired. That's the point. He um, was more or less working on f on final touches or corrections in the first edition of his main book, The Revolution de Revolutionibus Orbim Celestium, um, in uh, Torun in Poland um, when he died. His main work appeared in the year in which he died, the work that changed the world. Uh, baby boomers have clearly decided to solve the retirement crisis by working longer. Um, there has been a big uh, political impasse in doing th anything about uh, social insurance. Uh, no big changes in Social Security since 1983. Uh, that reform in 1983 gradually uh, raised the normal retirement age for Social Security to about 60, to right now it's 67, and that means it's an older age than most European countries, I think any European country. Um, early retirement age is at, nine, at 62, but benefit reduction for early retirement is counted now uh, from new normal retirement age backwards, so benefits for retirement at 65 are effectively being uh, cut. They're, um, they're already cut because we are now at the time when the retirement age... Um, actually, no, I think we're still gradually transitioning, but very soon normal retirement age for retirees um, all retirees, new retirees in Social Security will be 67. So a couple of words about uh, private defined benefit pension plans. Um, they are subject to Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, the most important law about um, uh, pension systems for by private employers and passed in 1974. And the main provisions are uh, must be held in a separate trust, funded in a manner subject to report to the Department of Labor by plan actuary. And there was a change in law in 2006 with the introduction of Pension Protection Act. The acceptable actuarial methods under ERISA include entry age, entry age with frozen initial liability, attained age, attained age with frozen initial liability, projected unit credit, and a specified aggregate cost method. And you will learn about the, all of these methods in later classes. Uh, both public and private sector employers uh, had traditionally used the entry age normal actuarial costing method. The reason for the shift in the private sector is that in 1985, um, Financial Accounting Statements Board, FASB, issued rules requiring sponsors to account for accruing pensions liabilities by uniform method, which was the projected unit credit actuarial cost method. So people used to use a variety of methods, and in 1985 a trend started when uh, the regulatory um, entities, although this is a private regulatory entity, it's an accounting body, but it started pushing employers to use um, 
projected unit credit method, which you actually already learn in exam LTAM. Um, Technically, FASB mandated the projected unit credit method only for reporting purposes, and firms could continue to use any of the six uh, actuarial methods authorized under ERISA for funding, because in terms of funding, how much they should be paying legally, um, they are regulated by the Department of Labor and subject to um, this ERISA law. Uh, sponsors, however, appear to have either interpreted the FASB standard as an endorsement of the projected unit credit for funding, as well as reporting, or simply found it more convenient to use the same method, because it is kind of hard to use various styles of accounting for uh, the same thing. As a result, a major shift occurred from entry age normal to projected unit credit for funding purposes. Um, and then, in 2006, uh, the federal government um, passed, well, the Congress passed the law um, the, where the whole thing switched completely to traditional unit credit, and the federal government prescribes the interest rate used for valuation. It's not even one interest rate, but it's three points on the yield curve, so valuation has become more complicated and that's for the valuation purposes for the Department of Labor regulation. And there's a special type of pension plans called Taft Harley multi-employer pension plans um, and this kind of plan is characterized by provisions allowing individual employees to gain credits towards pension benefits from work with multiple employers as long as each employer is a collective bargaining agreement requiring plan contributions. In other words uh, employees working um, uh, for different employers but um, uh, under one pension system. How can this be? Because they're in the same union, no matter which employer they work for. Think for think United Auto Workers. Um, uh, often many employers in the same industry in the ge geographic area contribute towards the same multi-employer plan. Thus, individual workers moving from job to job continue to earn credits towards future pension benefits. These plans are typically plans negotiated by multiple employers with one union, like United Auto Workers. But for pension plans provided by states and cities, defined benefit plans are not subject to a RISA, not regulated by the federal government, and they are under Government Accounting Statements Board, and they can use any pension funding method, and they have been very creative to try to not contribute money to the pension plans because they use money for other purposes. Think State of Illinois. Employees of federal government have the Civil Service Retirement System, uh, which originated in 1920 and has provided retirement, disability, and survivor benefits for most civilian employees in the U.S. federal government until the creation of a, of a new Federal em Employees Retirement System in 1987. Uh, it's a three-tiered system that consists of a defined benefit plan, Social Security, and a thrift savings plan. Thrift savings plan is a defined contribution plan. So a quick review of the Pension Protection Act of 2006. It established new minimum funding standards for single employer and multi-employer defined benefit pension plans. Uh, contributions are based on plans funding target. The minimum required contribution is the sum of the target normal cost. Normal cost is a standard expression for what you're supposed to pay into a pension plan. In uh, exam LTAM, uh, the, uh, the term is normal contribution from British actuarial terminology because a British book is used on that exam, but it means normal cost, uh, which is the value of benefits expected to accrue during the year plus an amortization of any funding shortfall. That All these actuarial methods have these provisions for allowing to promise some benefits from the uh, based on past service and not paying for them immediately, but spread the paying over time, and that's what this amortization is. Economic assumptions are now given by law, not assigned by the actual, actually not by law, but by the Department of Treasury based on the current circumstances. Uh, funding target is 100% of benefits accrued as of year beginning. And interest rates to value liabilities have three segment rates, less than 5 years, between 5 and 20 years, and 
20 plus years. Rates are provided by the Department of Treasury published once a month. Based on investment grade corporate bonds, averaged over 24 months. Alternatively, plan can use full yield curve without averaging. And the election, for, that's for valuation of the benefits, or for discounting future promised payments to employees to calculate how much they're worth in today's money and how much you should be paying for it. And the election evaluation rates cannot be changed unless special approval from the Department of Treasury is received. Mortality table will be provided by the Department of Treasury. Plan defined to be at risk, which has 80% or less funding if treated as not at risk last year, 70% or less if treated as at risk last year, require higher funding, not applicable to plans with um, 500 or fewer uh, participants. Those have more lenient rules. Assets can be reported at market value or average over 24 months, but the average must be between 90 and 110 percent of the market value, because that's also a tradition in pension uh, industry that you don't report the actual value of the assets, but rather um, amortize any losses or any gains. There's also one more type of uh, uh, plan, which is called a cash balance plan. Uh, is a type of a defined benefit plan that resembles a defined contribution plan, or sometimes called a hybrid plan. A cash balance plan looks like a defined contribution plan because the employer employee's benefit is expressed as a hypothetical account balance instead of a monthly benefit. Each employee's account receives an annual contribution credit, which is usually a percentage of compensation, and an interest rate uh, interest credit based on the guaranteed rate of some recognized index. This interest rate uh, credit uh, rate must be specified in the plan document. At retirement, the employee's benefit is equal to the hypothetical account balance, which represents the sum of all contributions and interest credits. Although the plan is required to offer the employee the option of using the account balance to purchase an annuity benefit, employees generally will take the cash balance and roll it into an individual retirement account. Anytime you get a, con a common kind of large distribution from a pension plan, for example, when you leave work of some type, you are allowed to put it into an individual retirement account tax-free, and this process is called a rollover. Um, unlike many traditional defined benefit plans, which do not offer lump sum payments at retirement, well, actually, if the balances are very small, they sometimes offer that. But the traditional defined benefit pension plans pay benefits in the form of annuity upon retirement. Just a quick review of uh, public pension plans, states and cities. In fiscal year 2008, um, which for most states ended on June 30th, 2008, states' pension plans had 2.8 trillion in long-term liabilities with more than 2.3 trillion sucked away to cover those costs. So they had already a pretty big uh, half a trillion deficit, but that was before the market crashed in 2008. Um, in 2000, slightly more than half the states had fully funded pension systems by 2006. The number had shrunk to six states. By 2008, only four, um, Florida, New York, Washington, and Wisconsin, could make that claim. Um, while only 19 states had funding levels below 80% mark in fiscal year 2006, 21 states were funded below that level in 2008. In eight states, Connecticut, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, and West Virginia, more than one-third of the total liability was unfunded. Two states had less than 60% of the necessary assets on hand to meet their long-term pension obligations, Illinois and Kansas. Generally, Illinois shows up at the bottom of any such classifications. These plans are not regulated by the federal government, and they can fund their pensions any way they want, and um, there is no provision in the U.S. law for a bankruptcy of a state, so it is quite a mystery about uh, as to how Illinois plans to pay its uh, defined benefit pension plans, which have been extremely generous to uh, state employees, because these plans are for state employees. A quick um, view of the trends in defined benefit plans. 
there has been a general decline in the role of defined benefit plans. Even federal government adopted a defined contribution plan. No new defined benefit plans are generally created. Um, defined benefit plans are, are very often turned into defined contribution plans or cash balance plans. And the private sector's shift in actuarial methods reduced pensions expense um, during the 1980s and 1990s when the baby boom generation were young workers and shifted pension expense and contributions for this very large cohort to later in their careers. Now that the baby boomers are approaching retirement, funding requirements will be higher than they would have been under the entry age normal cost method. The public sector, in contrast, faces a steady contribution rate, but the public sector is much more heavily underfunded, federal government the most, then Illinois, then California, then other states. Um, many moving parts in all this um, affecting each other, analyzing data from the Longitudinal Health and Retirement Study, Friedberg and Webb uh, conclude that, concluded in their research uh, that defined contribution plans lead to an increase in the retirement age of nearly two years on average compared with defined benefit plans. Moreover, the authors suggest uh, that their fun findings may explain the recent increase in employment rates among people in their 60s because they have defined contribution pension plans following decades of declines. They expect this trend to continue as more workers with defined contribution plans uh, reach retirement age and defined benefit plans become largely a thing on of the past. The defined contribution plans are um, the dominant form of uh, retirement system in the U.S. and the most pop popular type of a plan is called uh, 401k or 401k named after the section of the uh, tax laws which is called internal revenue code. So there are various types of um, private sector defined contribution pension plans. Um, profit sharing plans uh, work this way that if there is no profit, there is no contribution. Contributions are discretionary, meaning that you can raise, lower, or eliminate contributions as your profits dictate from year to year. Profit sharing plans can be integrated with Social Security, meaning that the benefits is reduced um, by the amount that you receive from Social Security. An advantage to employers, which can provide business owners and key employees with additional benefits or reduced benefits, but it is um, basically means that you can have more flexibility in terms of how you design the plan, and that probably can uh, be a way to, to give people more benefits if you have the money for it. Money purchase plans require... Uh, required to contribute the same percentage of employee salaries each year. For added flexibility, adding, um, offering both a profit sharing and money purchase pension plan gives you the ability to boost contributions when you want. 401k plans, salary, these are salary reduction plans, so the salary is reduced, the reduction amount goes into a, a pension plan or 401k plan, and that money that goes there is not taxed. Um, in, and it's paid into an account owned by the employee. Uh, matching by employer is not required, but very common. There are also um, individual 401ks uh, and Roth 401ks, new types recently, uh, relatively recently introduced. Um, Roth 401ks are probably more popular. And there is uh, Simplify Employee Pension IRA, SEP IRA, provides the benefits of a company-sponsored retirement program without the administrative expense. It's supposed to be simpler. Uh, government reporting requirements and complexity associated with any other types of retirement plans. Uh, these plans were specifically designed for self-employed individuals, sole proprietors, independent contractors, partnerships, small corporations, including so-called S-corporations. These are corporations owned by small numbers of only U.S. citizens and the owners of the corporation um, receive the uh, the uh, profits of the corporation basically as a pass through to them because taxes for this corporation are paid at the individual uh, 
income tax rates, not the corporate income tax rates. That used to be an advantage until the change in the law in 2018 when uh, the corporate tax rates in the U.S. were reduced. Um, simple IRA was a replacement for SEP IRA. Uh, now that's the form, that's the type of a, um, retirement system account that um, those small employers or self-employed individuals use, and SEP uh, IRAs have been uh, discontinued. There could be also a st employee stock ownership plan, where employees own stock of the employer. That's a bit of a risky design because if you lose your job because your employer is bankrupt, then you also lose the, the savings in that because the stock goes to zero. So it exists because employers want to motivate their employees, but not very popular with the government, which sees the risk in this. Nonprofit organizations have their own type of uh, pension, uh, defined contributions uh, pension system, that so-called 403B defined contribution plans, which are popularly called tax-deferred annuities, but they're basically just like 401k, but through nonprofit organizations. And states and cities, as employers, have so-called 457, that's again the section of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, defined contribution plans. And federal government um, has the Federal Thrift Savings Plan. I actually don't know what the amount of assets is right now. It used to be that, but it's, well, it's hopefully bigger. I don't know what it will be at the end of March 2020, but we will see. So these are roughly the main parts of the um, retirement system in the U.S. And you don't absolutely have to know every detail of this. I just want you to be aware of this. Um, and I will show you now some exercises about just the calculation of the benefit of a pension plan. So here's an exercise. Uh, the Fund Benefit Pension Plan has uh, with two members, uh, Finn and Oscar, provides for a pension benefit paid as a monthly whole life annuity due. The annual pension benefit is 1.7% of the final one year salary for each year of service. You are given that participants reaching age 64.5 retire at that time with probably 50%. All participants reaching age 65 in service retire immediately. There are no other retirements. There are no withdrawals from the plan and other than by death or retirement. Salaries increase every year on January 1st. Future salary increases are assumed to be 2% per year. On January 1st, 2018, Finn is 25 years old. He is a new employee with no past service. His salary in 2018 is 60000 On January 1st, 2018, Oscar is 64 years old and has 29 years of service. His salary in 2017 was 95000 and in 2018 is 100000 Calculate the projected replacement ratios for both Finn and Oscar, assuming that they each retire at exact age 65. So that's one concept that you should know, replacement ratio. That's a ratio of the benefit received upon retirement, the moment you retire, your annual benefit that first year, divided by the last salary. And we'll denote the salary at age X by big S X. Uh, so we calculate the projected replacement ratios for both Finn and Oscar, assuming that they each retired at exact age 65. Upon retirement, Finn's annual pension benefit is 65 minus 25 um, times 0 0.017, 1.7%, times uh, S64, his salary at age 64. His replacement ratio is therefore... 65 minus 25 times 0.017 times S64 over S64. That's 40 times 1.7% or 68%. Upon retirement, Oscar's annual pension benefit is based on 30 years of service because he will add one more year by the time he retires, and his annual pension benefit is 30 times 0.017 times S64, and his replacement ratio is uh, 30 times 0.017 times S64 over S64, so 30 times 1.7% or 51%.
Here's another exercise. A Starship Enterprise acting as an employer of its crew establishes a defined contribution DC plan. The contribution rate of the employee is 1% of salary and the employer contributes 10% of salary. Uh, the employee joins the plan at age 25 and the retirement age is 65. Initial salary of the employee is 40000 per annum and pension plan contributions are made at the beginning of each year. Salary increases at 2% per year. The plan is invested in a portfolio that earns 7% annual effective. Upon retirement, accumulated funds are used to buy a life annuity due, paid monthly, and you are given that A double dot 65 upper 12 is 11.25. Find the replacement ratio of this plan. Recall that the replacement ratio is the ratio of the first year pension benefit to the final year salary, the final year of work. And here's the, sol uh, the solution of this. Note that the last age of contribution is 64 because the employee retires at age 65. Let J be uh, equal to 1.07 over 1.02 minus 1, and that's approximately 4.901961%. The accumulated value of the contributions is 40,000 times 0.11 times 11%, 1% from the employee, 10% from the employer times 1.07 to the 40th plus 40,000 times 0.11 times 1.02 because of the 2% salary increase time, times 1.07 to the 39 and so on uh, through 40,000 times 0.11 times 1.02 to the 39 times 1.07 that's equal to 40,000 times 0.11 times 1.02 to the 0 times 1.07 to the 40th plus 1.02 to the 1st times 1.07 to the 39 and so on through 1.02 to the 39 times 1.07 if we factor out 1.07 to the 40th from this then this becomes 1 plus 1 over 1 plus j plus 1 over 1 plus j squared and so on through 1 over 1 plus j to the 39th and that's 40,000 times 0.11 times 1.07 to the 40th times a double dot angle 40 at that interest rate J that we calculated, and this is 1,202,085.94. This purchases an annual benefit of this amount divided by the cost of a unit annuity, and that's 106,852.08. The final salary is projected to be 40,000 times 1.02 to 39, because after 40 years the person retires, so this is the last year. 39 um, beginning of the 40th year salary um, that's 86,589.79 and the replacement ratio is 123.40 percent